Um, I'm going to tell you about different class of applications which can really benefit from in-memory computing. And uh, we call it these, these applications, applications that deliver continuous intelligence. Um, if you have a better name, I'm always keen to hear about it. And the whole goal here is to have applications that always know the answer. Um, and this is, I understand, quite different from the use cases primarily used by Grid Game thus far and Apache Ignite. So let's fly and please ask questions and so on. So my world is a world of edge, I guess. And I'm going to start with a number. <clears throat> the number um, is the ever-growing number of devices and products and so on that have CPUs and want to talk to you. Um, so ARM, which is one of our investors, now licenses 20 billion cores per year. That's 2 million an hour. And all these things have got a ton to say. And so organizations are simply facing an onslaught of data, and they've got to figure out what to do with it all. Um, just for example, the small town of Palo Alto, California, the traffic lights in downtown Palo Alto deliver more data per day than all of Twitter. And if I take you to, to Las Vegas, you know, that's 10 times the Library of Congress per day, just from the traffic lights. So we have a problem, you know, all these promises of smart cities and the smart environments are not gonna be realized unless we manage to deal with this. Sorry, turning off the phone. Okay, all right, and now I'm gonna tell you about a truly shocking size application, which is actually our largest, which is dealing with the equivalent of Facebook every day, and that is um, for a mobile provider in the US, where we are continuously tracking every single device in the network <clears throat> and every single mobile device, um, and scoring every mobile device for connection quality and optimizing the connections between devices and the infrastructure so that every user sees the best possible call quality. And so this is about 150 million mobile devices. And our goal is to find things like you're about to see, which is that a certain base station has gone down and that certain users are affected by it, and we need to reassign them to different capacity on the fly. Um, the amount of information we have to process here is absolutely staggering. It's about uh, four petabytes per day. So <clears throat> the idea here that is the big data is a joke, really. Um, you couldn't store this if you tried. And so the store then analyze idea from big data just isn't going to work. Moreover, the data value is short-lived. You don't care about this stuff um, from yesterday. <clears throat> and the data just never stops. It just never stops. So for four petabytes a day, it's about 10 gigabit, gigabytes per second, 24 hours a day. Okay. So even if you could afford to um, store this stuff, it's very slow to process it, and it's mismatched with the goal of the organization, which is to ensure that everybody is connected and getting the best quality connection at all times. So this is the category where we fit, which is continuous intelligence. Our goal is to shorten the um, decision-making time scales um, into the real-time notion, okay? So the whole notion of store and analyze in my world is a bit of a joke, and we replace that with analyze and react, and if you really care about the raw data or you can afford it, then you store later. And you buy into the fact that hard disks, by definition, are vastly slower than the CPU memory, okay? so. These are applications which run in memory. They have to analyze data on the fly and react. And they don't get to do all the usual stuff that we think about in applications and data. 
they don't think about um, SQL style queries against databases because we're never going to put the data down there anyway. So I'm going to call that continuous intelligence and I'm going to give you a few key characteristics that we have to strive for in all of our engagements. We always have to have the answer. And what I mean is that when data arrives, we compute. We don't wait for a query or a UI refresh or something like that, or a big data batch process. We compute when data arrives, okay? And that means we have to analyze, learn, and predict on the fly. And though I've seen a ton of really cool stuff going on in the Apache Ignite world related to real-time learning, in this case, I literally mean it. We have to figure out the model, build it, and learn on the fly. Okay, fundamentally, data drives computation, um, and it's the flow of data that builds the model and drives all of the computation, learning, and analysis. Give you another use case quickly. Um, <clears throat> we've been used in um, pick and place machine failure prediction uh, by a large uh, manufacturer. Um, by the way, there is a, a wonderful fail in this, um, and I'll tell you about that. So what we're trying to do here is, is predict when one of these pick and place machines is going to fail. They have about 600 sensors on them, and we're trying to predict uh, when, a sense, when the suction cups which pick up chips are, are about to do the wrong thing. Here is the big fail. If you are good at prediction, even if you're modestly good, even if you're really good, if you call Freddy back from lunch and the machine is not about to fail, he gets really annoyed. So failure prediction is one of those categories where, or where people who are expecting predictive technologies or AI to deliver exact answers. And yeah, you know, the, the real world is not that. Um, our technology is widely used in the US <clears throat> to do um, prediction for traffic load in cities. Here I've done some magic on the UI for uh, Palo Alto. Um, by the way, you can go to traffic.swim.ai and look at this stuff. And every single one of these, our job is to pr produce predictions for every single um, intersection. Um, and to do so continuously and then to sell those predictions to folks like Uber and Google and Apple and so on. And so the whole idea is that these can these we don't have time to build a model, we don't have time to train a model, and we just have to show up and work wherever we are. And Palo Alto is small by comparison with Houston. And I'm going to tell you how we do that. We're also used a ton in... Um, interesting places like Dubai to do cool stuff with traffic. And here I'm going to start hinting at some of the complexity of the applications that we have to deal with. Find all the trucks that are in or approaching a band area. For example, there's a festival going on and we want to find all the trucks that have been in there or are about to get there. Um, find all the trucks with bad braking behavior and tell the nearest inspector to pull them off. Actually, it's more sophisticated than that. Now, the key thing here is that for every truck, um, on every GPS update, I have to recompute the notion of bad braking behavior and do the geofence, which is, are you near an inspector, and then tell the inspector. And by the way, I have to do that for the whole city um, and all as time moves forward. So you get the idea of um, the need to respond in real time. Okay, cool. So let's dig into some technology. By the way, I've heard, read a lot about 100-fold improvements in uh, application performance using things like Apache Ignite. If we don't really care about storing raw data and getting things to disk, and we can stay in memory only, and then throw away the raw data, literally, we go a million times faster. And so for the mobile use case, the mobile carry use case I mentioned earlier, we're moving this customer from a 10 hour time scale and Hadoopish style infrastructure into 10 millisecond um, answers. And 
we get to go a lot cheaper too. <clears throat> Instead of a ton of Hadoop nodes, say 500, we're using about 40 nodes of SWIM. By the way, all I'm telling you is stuff you already know, which is that Moore's Law has done wonderful things to CPUs and memory, and networks and disks are still terrible. All right, we've got to make this stuff easy to op develop and operate, and I'm really delighted to see the work that's gone on in Ignite. In our world, <clears throat> there are two fundamental DSLs. One is Java, and the other one is, well, Java UIs are JavaScript and TypeScript, but then also we're allowing people to do real-time, um, I guess, data science on live data using um, toolkits written in Python. So you could hook up PyTorch and hey ho, you're off the races. I'm going to tell you how we do that. Okay, just I wanted to clarify the statement of going a million times faster we can move our customer from 10 hour insights to 10 milliseconds um, and really this is just Moore's law um, to execute an instruction on any old cpu nowadays is about a nanosecond maybe 10 times that if given memory um, but to get a memory to make really a megabyte from this is millions of times slower than that and to go from US west to east is worse. Okay. So the moment we hit a disk or a network, we're in deep trouble. And the whole point in SWIM is to avoid that. That is, we are absolutely optimized for doing computation in memory. And when we uh, reach out to in the distributed architecture, um, our goal is to limit round trip well any node in a swim cluster is on maximum half or, or half an rtt out of date by the way i am a huge um non-fan of rest and databases in the following sense rest has allowed clouds to scale wide and an old server can do my job for me but statelessness is my big problem here so rest and statelessness going hand in hand and the fact that clouds mandate that all state lives in a database this is hugely problematic because to get hold of any state i'm going somewhere else and i'm running a million times slower already so the whole point in swim is to get rid of that by adopting a stateful architecture and by the way we kind of get rid of the database too um, now, I'm not going to advocate SWIM for database-centric uh, applications, for example, my bank account, but for things which relate to the real world, yeah, that's just fine, it turns out. So, a couple of words on databases. I'm a huge fan of databases and smart ones. There are bazillions to choose from, um, and they're all doing wonderful things becoming resilient and so on. But there are some major challenges when we're dealing with large systems, such as my mobile provider example I gave you earlier. The database itself doesn't find meaning in the data or build a model. And you see here me using a graph-centric notion of, um, of data and analogy. Actually, when we deal with real-world systems, Graphs are really useful and perhaps are the most common structures that we would want to use anyway. <clears throat> In our world, relationships are not defined, or at least they're not constant, they're very fluid. <clears throat> so a truck with bad braking behavior suddenly has the relationship to the nearest inspector, but that is a fluid thing. And so this very definitely doesn't fit into the normal relational database type semantic. <clears throat> we want data to drive computation. And so fundamentally here, I want the arrival of data to drive analysis, learning, and prediction. And databases don't do that. Now, 
databases have done fabulous things with regards to driving acid properties, particularly in this big distributed clusters and so on. But for many real world applications, we just don't care. That is what matters most is statistics, things you can compute from large amounts of data and not transactional correctness for every single piece of data. Um, <clears throat> I have an, an analogy here, which is this. If, I, if you watched a, an airplane taken off at an airport uh, and you see it, but then it goes behind a building and then pops out again once it pops out far side of the building, you didn't get the updates when it was behind the building and hidden from view. Do you care? No. Nope. What you care is that you're eventually consistent and the plane immersion carried on taking off. Okay. That notion of acid correctness is really uh, very seldom required in the real world. By the way, the notion of truth in my world is often statistical. So there isn't a clear notion of um, of the current state of a thing. Many things give me estimates anyway, or time windows of measurements or whatever happens to be. And so in general, our job is to try and understand what is going on in data so we can make useful use of data elements distributionally or statistically um, in algorithms. And, and there's a whole category of algorithms which are really important, many of which are in SWIM, um, related to you know, boundless processing of huge amounts of data. And you know, these are sketches and various forms of unsupervised learning. Time in my world is fundamental. And it's not just for ordering things. So I have a huge problem with the notion of a time series database. Yeah, everybody can order things according to time, but time is really important in real world systems over time. So is it approaching? That's about over time. Is it, you know, its behavior is an over time notion. And so the idea of processing large amounts of data to understand be, um, behavioral semantics is all about understanding time and its importance. Okay, and then finally, relationships in my world are fluid, they change a lot. They're often mathematically generated. So for example, um, you know, greater than some function or less than some function or something, and they're geospatial. Am I near a store or am I near a base station in the case of mobile? And so these things have to be continuously computed every single update. All right, so a single event can, can, can cause cascading reevaluations throughout my entire data structure, as it were, for my application. And for this reason, databases are really tragic because a single event can cause you know really hundreds of millions of cycles of wasted time as i um, pull through the database fundamentally databases don't run applications and really what i'm trying to look for is a, a loop a control loop where the data drives the application logic now another way of looking at this is event streaming um, and Kafka and Pulse are examples here. So some unknown number of producers throws events into some number of topic queues and some unknown number of functions, lambdas, applications, consume from that. Yay, this does this help. It, it's a great buffer. Um, ultimately, if I have a, an application, the problem that the application has is that typically, the lambdas pull events from buffers and stick them in dead base, and the application then has to make sense of it and decide what's useful. So the traditional approach there is that the application is driven by some client, maybe stream analy streaming analytics-based client or something. I get it. This is a solved problem in my view. In general, if you have complex computations, and here I show some very simple limits, 
um, that relate to the consequences of many events, for example, the engine temperatures, greater than some amount, and so on, then I might trigger a certain application behavior. If I have a single thread or single event notion, which is very much part of the Kafka pulsar world with a single lambda, I don't get to see these things. And what I want is to compute on the entire graph of interdependent uh, components of data all at once. Okay, so I want to always have the answer to be able to analyze, learn, and predict on the fly and to drive computation from the data as it arrives. These things are great at <clears throat> delivering events, but they are not good at running applications, as we well know. By the way, this holds true, I guess, also for things like um, AWS Lambda and so on. And you've already guessed where I'm going because I've said that statelessness is a big enemy. So stateful computing scales both up and out. The cloud has scaled out very well, but hasn't scaled up very well in the sense of performance, sense of um, algorithms or applications like the ones that I'm about to tell you about. So stateful and in-memory computing scales up very nicely. The out notion, I'm gonna point you to swimos.org. So swimos.org is all the open source um, swim platform. Um, it scales out fabulously because swim clusters are never more than half an RTC out of date. I'll tell you about that as we go through this. Um, we're going to compute on the fly driven by data and hopefully you're beginning to see a model from your computer science 101 days which tell you how we can actually do this. So the arrival of data drives the analysis and computation. Um, we're going to use that context which is that um, when data arrives i'm immediately going to reevaluate all the dependencies on that data find associations build new uh, relationships and use that to de uh, derive meaning in my in, in my application okay and the key requirement for me is to make this easy um, i'm going to take it on the path that we use to get there using Java and Python. Okay, so and a quick introduction to SWIM. SWIM uses the actor model. Well, you could think of it as the actor model, but it's quite different. It is, what we do is we have a, a stateful concurrent thing called a web agent for every single data source that continuously and statefully analyzes data from its real world twin, its sibling out there somewhere. Okay, and I show a picture of a, an intersection out here. Um, to the right, you'll get an analogy with my application uh, for traffic, which you can see, by the way, at traffic.swim.ai. Um, so <clears throat> think of these actors as independent concurrent entities. And in the case of my mobile operator, with 150 million mobile devices and a bunch of other network elements, we're looking at 500 million odd concurrent processes, each of which is stateful. Each one of these things dynamically links to related agents. And this concept of linking is really important. It allows me to create a fluid in-memory graph that tracks complex relationships. In the case of traffic, which I'll go through in a little more detail, you see uh, this intersection is linked to its neighbors. Great. And linking can indicate very powerful things like containment uh, or proximity, neighborliness or is approaching, things like that. It can indicate computed relationships, so correlation to or predicted to be within. Okay. So Linking allows us to form an in-memory graph that links related web agents, each of which is an actor, and the links get dynamically built and torn down as the world moves around us. Now, what is a link? And why are we calling these web agents? They're called web agents because links 
are literally URIs. And that's important because for everything in the world, if I have a URI for it, I have access to its APIs and I can immediately send it data from the real world and it will then link to other things in its world and we'll see some results. Okay, so web agents are actors. They are actors with a really critical um, modification. They don't use message passing. Um, we use a different model entirely for state passing. Linked agents use each other's state to continuously analyze, learn, and predict. And I'm going to cover that in a bit more detail. So whatever I link to, I can see. I, I can see the state of other agents and use that in my own calculations to build relationships, to analyze, learn, and predict. Okay, and then agents stream their insights. So one way you can think of Swim is this, it's kind of a, a smart, application which sits in the way of a ton of data and turns a ton of data into vastly less as highly calculated refined insights that are computed on the fly okay so an example of what web agents can do is in this slide so web agents can do really powerful things they can continuously learn and predict and i'm going to cover that use case on the next slide they can implement powerful query type structures they can do map reduce continuous map reduce um, they can do graph type queries over their links and they could implement relational type structures that we don't today have anything like a sql they can perform analysis and in general we use things like sketches to do that and they can integrate with external capabilities or investments in, in um, analytical infrastructure. So Spark, Flink, whatever. Um, but more, more recently and cool is something like Jupyter Webbench. So if I have a bunch of distributed web agents sitting in memory somewhere, I can use my Jupyter Workbench to fire up some new analytic, which then computes over those web agents. So I can do real-time live analysis of live things in memory, which are continuously being updated by the real world. Kind of fun. Okay, so in terms of unsupervised learning, I was debating with myself whether I should go through this in more detail because this is a sophisticated audience. I decided not to. Forgive me if this is a bit rudimentary. <clears throat> In traffic, for example, a digital twin of an of a, an intersection, so a web agent which represents maybe 80 or 100 local sensors, links to its neighbors. Okay, so it links to all of the intersections around it, and it can form input vectors from the sensors of its own and its neighbors, and successively push those through a DNN. Well, on day one, it creates a DNN where all the links are initialized to random numbers, takes a guess, pushes an input vector through it, and up pops some prediction. On day one, it's a guess. But the wonderful thing about these web agents is they get to know that the real world will provide them with truth very shortly. And so truth allows us to find the difference between the prediction value and the observed value that's the error and we can back propagate and so we have a very simple way for adapting many learning algorithms to do unsupervised training and uh, it turns out by the way this is purely based on experience and practice that these things are really good if you leave them for a while moreover you get to track the error rate and if the error is converging you're getting better and if it's diverges you're in deep trouble okay but relatively unsophisticated very small dnns can do amazing things the dnn for something like an intersection in palo alto has probably got a thousand inputs okay every single intersection is predicting its own future so i have three slides which go into swim in a little bit more detail um, 
so a web agent is a thing it's a little object and by the way in <clears throat> when you program them you're just using java the swim is really a set of extensions to java um, web agents are universally addressable because their object id is a uri they are stateful in memory during runtime and they're persistent because they change their state all the time and behind the scenes swim is continuously writing an append only log which maintains the state of this entire model at every node now there is a cache coherency protocol which links web agents to one another so in this graph of web agents which we're going to build as one web agent changes its state anything that is linked to it sees the change within half rtt how does that happen every single instance in a big distributed swim application maintains a local view of the entire graph and um, updates that graph whenever it receives a streaming update from a web agent um, on some other node okay so it's like a cache coherency protocol between web agents um, and they're very small typically they're you know a kilobyte or so overhead per agent and they're very self-sufficient each one of these things is a little bit like um, a row in a database with the program attached okay and we end up building a self-sufficient distributed runtime where the application programmer just writes an object on your program they just don't have to care about where things run so there are some analogies one can draw between web agents and things you've seen before um, you know pick them on a random the object oriented world you know an agent would be an object a lane would be a member and a link would be a reference but that misses a ton of the semantics and the concurrency if picking another row the actor model you'd have a concurrent actor with a mailbox as its lane by the way we don't have message passing as you've seen and messages get passed as part of the um, part of the links so I'll leave you to digest this when you get the slides of the um, of the presentation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions in uh, in due course. The basic architecture is that we end up with a worldwide web of web agents, each one which has a URI, each of which <coughs> receives raw data from something. You know either a real world source or maybe a, a row of a database or something um, each of which computes concurrently continuously on that data and streams its output okay streams its output to other databases or to uis and and so on and we can deploy these applications across the edge you know the fog and the cloud we really don't care um, Again, I'd be happy to take questions. In the context of UIs and delivering visual um, output from these applications, there are some really important um, additions that Swim has made to the UI framework. Um, UIs are written in JavaScript around types, TypeScript object bindings. And those TypeScript objects literally bind to web agents. So they see updates in real time from web agents as they change their state. So we can, for the first time ever, deliver absolutely real-time UIs in any old browser. What is the Swim application? It's an active graph of web agents. So sure, it's easy to create a bunch of independent uh, web agents for, say, intersections. But these intersections are all related. They figure out their relatedness, by the way, because all I have to do is tell them to link to all other intersections within a thousand meters. And they figure it out because that's in a fine geospatial comp uh, computation, just part of SWIM. And hey, presto, they will link. And linking gives them a relationship which is computationally defined and access to all the inputs that they need to derive uh, value from that to uh, 
to let them compute. So the application itself, which is um, a big distributed application computing for every intersection in Palo Alto or Houston or Jacksonville or wherever, computing the predicted future state for every single intersection in the city is composed of independent actors, these little web agents, each of which is predicting for itself. And so an application is potentially thousands and thousands or millions of these web agents, each of which is actively, actively computing its own future and, and producing analysis. And in the case of traffic, say Las Vegas, 5,000 DNNs all concurrently executing, given their inputs from their neighbors. Okay, it's a different way of thinking about applications. Okay. A quick word then about making it easy for real humans, and then I'll stop. In the Swim world, the developer builds an object-oriented Java application. Java, Swim is just a bunch of extensions to Java um, and deploy using standard tools. Swim then uses streaming data from the real world to instantiate these actors. <clears throat> so one of the beautiful things about the actor model is that you can build a, create new actors on the fly. So we instantiate a web agent for everything we see in raw data. That thing links to other things that are related to it. For example, every intersection links to every other intersection within a thousand meters of it. They continuously process, receive and process their own raw data and stately evolve in memory. And then they stream their results. They stream their analysis and predictions in real time over their links. Now, the cool thing about this approach is that the application at runtime, you know, in a large city, I could have 20 or 30,000 intersections. So in a large telco, I have you know, 500 million web agents, the application gets built at runtime by streaming data. So it automatically scales the app based on the real world. And then these things build their links, they build the databases were in memory, and it just works. It's pretty trippy. Where does this stuff from? People always go on about edge computing being the future of the world and whatever else. Actually, you know, the edge really isn't a place. The edge is the first chance you get to compute on data um, that isn't encrypted and where you can get hold of a CPU. So the edge really is where your data comes from and you compute wherever you can, typically in the cloud, actually for most of our applications. Um, so, in the swim world, concretely, we deploy in containers, Linux containers uh, on Kubernetes. And, you know, because of Kubernetes, we could be spanning from the edge all the way into the cloud. And typically, that is the case. In a city, we would have some presence, typically in the city data center, but then also smearing up into, um, into Azure. Okay. And so, Every instance in a swim deployment is composed of roughly three layers, a distributed stateful edge data processing fabric, which I'll go into, this ability to build these um, web agents, these digital twins, and then algorithms for streaming analysis and so on. And these instances deploy the same code everywhere. So when we deploy in a large distributed application, we deploy the same code, to build a few megabytes of code, to every single instance. The instances interconnect, and they do so using WebSockets. Um, and then these instances then start to create web agents, which are in-memory objects, which link across this cluster. And by linking across the cluster, now you'll get into the coherency protocol. So agents can link across the cluster to, to different um, instances at runtime. And 
whenever an agent modifies its state, everything it is linked to automatically receives the update. By the way, I'm just trying to tempt you to go off and play with sumos.org. So where does it run? You know, in the case of um, traffic, for example, um, Swim automatically migrates the web agents which are used to get from dead to state towards the physical edge because that's where we get to get rid of a bunch of data. Um, but Swim would also naturally migrate a web agent which was doing learning to something which had a GPU attached. And Swim has a bunch of really cool constraints which allow it to move web agents at runtime. If you had an ability or a desire to run your application more towards you know, your own on-prem resources, no problem, Swim can do that. And Swim can move agents at runtime without loss of state. Okay, I'm gonna pause here, um, answer any questions. Our job, similar, similar book, in a way different to Apache Ignite is to analyze, learn, and predict on the fly. And in particular, we need to build models and analyze data in a way which is not dealt with by most humans. We need to always have the answer. And so there are a bunch of really cool algorithms which are part of SWIM, which allow us to um, analyze using sketches, um, use unsupervised learning, and so on. Um, and then react in real time. I haven't talked about that much, but because you get the idea these things are independent programmable agents, they can do whatever you want. They can uh, dance a jig or they can send an alert to a mobile phone. Because everything is always in memory and in general, we never touch a disk. That is, to the extent we save the model, sure we do, that's an append-only log and it happens afterwards and it's not on the fast path. Um, we get to go a million times faster and that literally is the difference in speed between a snail and an F-18. Humans don't get it generally. We get to use vastly less infrastructure. That is, we give you back all of the benefits of Moore's law and in general, that's a, a value proposition of in-memory computing anyway. Applications in this world are easy to develop and run. We're just using Java or Python. And we can finally let data scientists loose to go and play with web agents, which are up and running somewhere in memory. And they can develop new algorithms and push them into production on the fly as traits which get attached to web agents. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to encourage you once more to go off to sumos.org to play. And um, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and thank you for having me. Thanks, uh, Simon. I, I, I see one question um, in the questions panel. Um, William is asking, uh, can you explain how you map web agents to cluster servers to minimize networking overhead across links? Ah, what a fabulous question. Thank you, William. Um, so web agents get created uh, by SWIM um, and mapped onto the initial set of resources, which is some number of instances based on a, I guess you can think of it as a distributed hash tree kind of algorithm so a web agent would get created someplace where the hashing algorithm decided it should run and then swim continuously evaluates for every every agent um, where it should best run and those metrics are to this date sufficient um, they include things like proximity to the source of data um, proximity to, well, actually, desire for memory, CPU, uh, affinity for additional resources like GPUs and so on. Um, and then Swim migrates select a, a set of candidates or web agents, which um, it can migrate around the cluster. Migrating agents is easy because 
on every instance, we have the full model of the system which is being built on the fly. And any um, data infidelity, so for example, I could move a way agent to a, an instance where the data is not up to date, um, that it will just follow it. It'll follow it as soon as it's referenced. So it's a little bit of an art, um, and it's an area that we're continuously working on. Uh, by all means, feel free to dive in and contribute. You know, maybe before we wrap up, there's one question that came last minute is, how does the app developer learn about which links are used? So an app developer, <clears throat> so let's go back to my traffic example. An app developer is the developer who knows about things like sensors at an intersection and a logical thing called an intersection, which isn't a real object, right? And so the first time data shows up for a sensor, um, the data will say, I'm at this particular location, say, Latin long, and here's a sensor value. Cool, we create a new web agent for that sensor, and that sensor automatically wants to belong to an intersection. If the intersection web agent doesn't exist, we'll create it. Cool. And now as additional sensors show up with data, they will also become members of that um, web agent for that intersection. Okay. So the creation is based on unique attributes. So creating actors, creating web agents is based on unique attributes of the data. So an, a sensor would uniquely identify itself, for example, or an, inter, an intersection. Plus a little bit of programming, which is that ultimately for traffic, what I want to have happen is this. I want every um, web agent for an intersection to continuously learn using its own sensors plus values from its neighbors. So the notion of linking to your neighbors is implicit in this. So part of the, what I'm going to write as my program is link to all of the other intersections within a thousand yards. And that computation of a thousand yards would be and a fine geospatial computation. It's just part of swim. I hope I answered the question. Awesome. Thanks, Simon. Um, <clears throat> um, Thank you. Please come play. And uh, thanks once again for having me.